Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and very warm welcome to this excellence gala dinner event. My name is Nurul Indarti and I have the pleasure of serving as your moderator for this splendid evening of celebrations, networking and meaningful conversations. Thanks especially to uh, the organizing committee, Dr. Gigi, and also the director of publications unit, uh, Dr. Vidya Paramita, who invited me to take a part of this uh, prestigious event. Tonight, uh, we have gathered here for an, uh, an extraordinary occasion where we will not only um, entertain in the vinous culinary delights, but also engage in stimulating discussions. We are honored to have a diverse and distinguished group of individuals in attendance. Uh, each of you contributing to the reach of experiences we'll, uh, we will share. Uh, during the course of this evening, we will enjoy delightful conversations uh, centered around the theme of collaborative research and policy actions for achieving sustainable development goals. As your moderator, I encourage each and every one of you to embrace the spirit of camaraderie and engagement. Uh, please feel free to immerse yourselves in the discussions, exchange ideas, uh, and forge new connections. This is a night for celebrations and intellectual enrichment. In these sessions, we have three distinguished uh, speakers with us who will share their valuable insight on three related topics. And now, without further ado, I would like to invite the first speaker, Professor Holder Dusk uh, from the International Association for Accounting, Education and Research. Uh, he is also a professor from University of Mannheim, Germany, who is joining online with us via a Zoom platform. Uh, I just want to make sure your availability, Professor Dux. Are you already here? Yeah. How, how are you? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for making your time uh, to join the sessions. We are sorry uh, for the delay uh, for waiting uh, the participant coming in the dinner. The second speaker is Associate Professor Dr. Friendly from Nagoya University of Commerce and Business Japan. And, and the third speaker is Associate Professor Yanto Chandra from the City University of Hong Kong, as well as the Director of Technology Policy Law Lab City University of Hong Kong. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my honor to invite Associate Professor Dr. Friendly and also Associate Professor uh, Chandra to come forward to the stage. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, the first session will be delivered by Professor Dux. Uh, let me introduce uh, his CV. Professor Dux is a professor of accounting and capital market from University of Mannheim, Germany. He is currently acting as chair of accounting and capital market. He is also very active as uh, a visiting professor at various universities, such as the IECE Business Schools, University of Navarra, Spain, University of Sydney, Australia, London Business School, the United Kingdom. Professor Dirks received his PhD in accounting with summa cum laude from Rude University, Frankfurt, Germany. He got diploma in business administrations with honors, graduated as the top student. He is also very active in publications. He published many articles in the field of IFRS, the capital market and information economics, corporate valuations, accounting for financial instruments in top tier journals, such as Journal of International Accounting Research, Journal Accounting and Public Policy, Management Science, uh, Journal of Accounting Research, and etc. Ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted to have Professor Dux with us today, who will be sharing his expertise on enforcement of principles-based financial reporting standards, what have we learned. 
please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Professor Dux. Professor, the virtual floor is yours. Please proceed with your presentations. And the time yeah, is about 20 minutes. Yeah, thanks very much. Can you see my slides? Yes, clear. Okay, excellent. So a warm welcome to everyone. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to give this speech at this prestigious conference in its 11th version already. I fully understand that the conference is on policy action for achieving sustainable development goals. Now in the area of accounting, Sustainability reporting standards are just being developed by the IFRS Foundation and IFRS S1 and IFRS S2 on climate-related disclosures have just been put up for discussion. Yet we know that accounting standards work and have beneficial consequences only if they are properly applied and enforced by oversight bodies because the auditor is not enough to ensure a proper uh, application. Now, in my talk, I will therefore focus on what we have learned about the enforcement of global financial reporting standards, IFRS, because those insights will equally become relevant for the corresponding sustainability standards of the IFRS Foundation or any other sustainability reporting regimes. So what's the um, so um, enforcement of principle based uh, IFRS? What have we what have we learned? So the motivation of my talk is that the global financial reporting standards or IFRS have been in existence for 20 years. Research has stressed the key role of strong enforcement of IFRS for the benefits to materialize. However, I will argue that it's not really trivial, it's not easy to implement strong enforcement. What does it really mean? Because IFRS are principle-based. So what's the issue I'm going to talk about? Well, IFRS, the International Financial Reporting Standards, are by design principle-based. That means they re require a lot of judgment if a transaction is addressed only by broad principles. Now, in many individual IFRS standards, they explicitly call for the application of judgment. So, for example, if you count the term judgment in the corpus of IFRS standards in the rule book, you find that 540 times spread across 72 different accounting standards, and the IFRS Foundation requires judgment of the preparer. For example, when you look at just, just a random example of IFRS 10, determining whether rights are substantive requires judgment, taking into account all facts and circumstances. In addition, in its conceptual framework, they use the phrase substance over form, and in accounting measurement, judgment emerges due to family so by design, the exact implementation of the standards are left to preparers and their auditors. And there's enough evidence for the view that judgment can even result in different, in different acceptable accounting solutions. The IFRS Interpretation Committee has permitted that in several areas. And also, if you look into the IFRS commentaries and the applied accounting literature, you can find the views uh, that different solutions could be possible. Now, that's, of course, a challenge for those who want to enforce IFRS, the enforcement regulators. They should play a decisive role to ensure that accounting rules such as IFRS are properly applied. And if there's one key result from the IFRS literature, it is that enforcement needs to be strong for IFRS benefits really to materialize. So what's the issue now? It's not trivial to implement strong enforcement because you have a lot of this judgment which is permitted IFRS. So um, how are IFRS really implementable in a strong way? And as an academy, as researchers, we until recently know very little about how enforcement of IFRS really works in practice. So what we have we learned? And I will give an oversight talking about 
the institutions, the actors, the courts, and the politics. So please hang on. So what we have learned about the in institutions which enforce IPRES standards? Well, the scientific literature is pretty brief. They use rather crude proxies, such as an index of, of several features of an enforcement. A new paper, a working paper by Bismarck, Litjens and Osemal, they create, based on data, a framework of IFRS enforcement, and they code 50 different elements of what uh, IFRS enforcement could mean, and then they uh, generate some um, interesting insights. Two insights I want to present here. So they distinguish between enforcement on the books, and enforcement on the books means to what extent do national countries implement multinational enforcement regimes? And enforcement in practice means to what extent are enforcement cases really observable in practice? Because one thing is on the books and the other thing is how this is really applied in practice. What you see across countries is that more and more countries implement yeah, enforcement guidelines of international institutions. So enforcement on the books is going up. However, enforcement in practice is rather going down over time. So if you look at the allocated resources to enforcement agencies, the number of performed reviews of the enforcement agent, the sanctions issued, making sanction public, etc., PP, this rather becomes weaker over time across the world. So what have we learned about the institutions enforcing IFRS? Well, there's still significant cross-country cross variation. And over time, we see more enforcement on the books, but rather weaker in practice. What have we learned about the actors involved in this, in this game? So how is compliance with IFRS really constructed in practice? And here, some qualitative field studies on IFRS based on interviews are relevant. So researchers really went into the field, asked enforcement agents, preparers, and auditors, how do you deal with those interpretations? How, you, how do you deal with this uncertainty? So they explore the process of how compliance with IFRS is constructed. When you look into that literature, um, for example, for the preparers' perspective on IFRS enforcement, you see that preparers try to anticipate the enforcer's view about a specific IFRS interpretation by discussing among peers, so companies talk to other companies, by participating in enforcer's events, and by using audit firms as advisors. They also try to document their judgments significantly so that Afterwards, if they are challenged, they can really make their case why they interpret the standards in a certain way. Um, then, what about enforcers' perspective on IFRS enforcement? Well, enforcement agencies, enforcement regulators, they try to define boundaries of what's still um, yeah, within the IFRS standards and what not. And they have to make sure that also their case is solid because the preparers, the firms, could always go to court and challenge the enforcement agency. So overall, enforcement investigations in the case of IFRS are really a battle of arguments because it's judgment-based. It's really about who has the better arguments for the specific case at hand. The big four auditors play a huge role in IFRS enforcement because they have information advantages, because they consult both the enforcement agency at times and at other times, preparers and firms preparing the IFRS financial statements. So they know more and they can really use their network and shadow interpret IFRS. Then the so-called professional literature plays a huge role you may have seen the IFRS commentaries of the big four auditing firms. They are like the interpretive Bible. So if there's really an, 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 a, a dispute, those um, yeah, commentaries are really used as a source. There are also local interpretations of, of IFRS and some actors even write interpretive articles in some applied accounting journals to make the case for a specific positions. In terms of consequence of error findings, um, they are at the moment quite low. So if firms 
don't comply and um, yeah the enforcement regulator finds um, yeah some 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 mistakes typically an error message is disclosed and the impact on capital markets is typically small on average so it doesn't matter that much for the firm but it matters for the personal reputation of the um, auditors and the, and the um, yeah the chief accountants uh, involved so if an enforcement regulator finds an issue publishes an error note with IFRS then the accounting department within the firm or the auditor signing those statements are the ones who get personal troubles, but less so the firm. So conclusions on the actors. Enforcement of IFRS is a battle of arguments. There's a significant role of the big audit firms and there's a high acceptance of uh, error rate finding by the enforcement agency because of low impact and high cost. What about the courts? Why do the courts um, play a role? Because IFRS are endorsed in national law and any action by the enforcement regulator can be challenged in the courtroom. So the courts or judges have a final say on local disputes in IFRS application. When we empirically um, go into the field, we see that there's only a very limited number of court cases on, on IFRS. And the reason is that enforcement regulators usually rather have a so-called explain and improve approach that if they find an error, they really um, yeah, motivate the preparer to change in the future. And therefore the penalties are typically mild. And if the penalties are mild, firms rather accept that rather than suing the regulator, having high legal cost, a long time frame for, for a court case and very uncertain outcomes. So from a cost-benefit analysis, it usually doesn't pay off for the preparer if they are, um, yeah, 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 if they are, um, it, it doesn't pay off for a preparer really to, to go to court. So if we now zoom into the um, low number of court cases on IFRS interpretation, there's one prominent court case in Germany, the OLK Frankfurt, where the enforcement regulator claim that for accounting issues we are wrong in the IFRS financial statement of Axel Springer, which is the big media house in Germany, publishing, for example, the Bild Zeitung and other things. And um, so which guiding principles did the OLG Frankfurt then apply? First of all, he said, yes, the enforcement regulator has a role in capital market protection, so they can apply at their own reasonable judgment. However, the court also added important qualifications to the enforcer's authority. So even if there is an issuance of a corrective note, this does not automatically mean that the preparers are at fault. And for really severe sanctions, much stricter requirements, say, um, of the um, criminal court cases would be, would be applied. So effectively, the court limited possible sanctions on IFRS enforcement. So conclusions on the courts, no meaningful role of courts in interpretation of IFRS and the civil versus the criminal law logics apply for relevant sanctions. Finally, to politics. So do political forces also shape IFRS enforcement actions? And yes, they do. So for example, the, the Security Exchange Commission of, of the United States um, is considered really the gold standard of security regulation and enforcement. Yet there is enough significant evidence that there is significant political interference also with SEC enforcement actions. So, for example, U.S. firms with ties to U.S. politics or those who have ties to ex-former SEC employees are less likely to experience an enforcement action. With regard to IFRS enforcement of foreign countries, the SEC is more lenient, follows rather an, 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 an comment letter approach and uh, to improve in future periods. So the interpretation, so this for, um, leads to the interpretation that the SEC is more lenient with foreign IFRS as compared to US issuers. When you look into the enforcement uh, regime of the European Union, you find a lot of issues. For example, even in Germany, there are huge incentive issues. You see the picture of Dr. Edgar Ernst, who has been the head of the German enforcement regulator. Yet, 
he also had several supervisory board assignments, and now there's significant there's scientific evidence um, that those firms in which he was in the supervisory board got less enforcement actions. So there are a number of issues in local setup with enforcement institutions, which is why um, probably enforcement works more on the books than in practice. The final point I'm going to make is that in case accounting enforcement hits other realities, such as, for example, a financial crisis, other policy goals become relevant. So, for example, during the global financial crisis, we witnessed that uh, yeah, banks were saved by national governments, and therefore they also practiced more lenience in terms of accounting enforcement. Accounting enforcement became less relevant when the government had other objectives. So when my, this leads me to conclude that when IFRS rules become part of real politics, they are framed according to interests, and that the political, the elective representatives, really beats the technical or the bureaucrats. So in some conclusions on politics, when the stakes are high, political forces play a dominant role in shaping IFRS enforcement actions, and policymakers use lenience with IFRS enforcement for regulatory forbearance. That brings me to my main takeaways. What have we learned about the enforcement of international accounting standards, which may also be relevant for the enforcement of sustainability reporting going forward? The enforcement of principle-based IFRS is a matter of persuasion and discussion and interpretation of incentives of the players and of the power of the players going forward. So that's been uh, my talk. Thanks very much for your um, for your patience, and I look forward to your questions after we have heard two other very interesting talks. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Dux, for an incredibly insightful presentations. Uh, um, I'm not account scholars, but I tried to, you know, a bit summarizing uh, the points uh, by studying IFRS court cases and drawing lessons from them, uh, particularly stakeholders. Uh, stakeholders can work towards better compliance, improve financial report practices, and a stronger understanding of the legal implications associated with uh, IFRS standard. So again, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor um, Dutz. Uh, can we please uh, give uh, a round of applause again uh, to show our appreciations for Professor Dutz's valuable contributions. Now, uh, I would like to invite uh, our second speaker, Associate Professor uh, Dr. Friendy, uh, let me introduce uh, his CV. Uh, he is Associate Professor uh, from Nagoya University of Commerce and Business and Business Japan. Uh, Associate Professor Friendy completed his doctorate and master's degree at the Graduate Schools of Economics, Nagoya University, where he received the Japanese government scholarship called MEXT. He obtained a bachelor degree in economics with honors, uh, majoring in accounting from our Lofet faculty, from our faculty a uh, couple years ago. So he is actually our alumni. Why you didn't apply to, to become a lecturer at our faculty? <laughs> okay, he passed the US certified public accounting exam and he is a member of many associations, uh, to name a few. Uh, that is the American Institute of CPAs, the Institute of Management Accountant, and the Japan Accounting Associations. His research interests include sustainable development, uh, sustainable sustainability reporting and disclosures, corporate governance, audit, and financial accounting. He has presented, uh, he has presented, presented, uh, papers at many conferences. Uh, some of them are the American Accounting Associations annual meeting, the European Accounting, uh, annual conference, um, uh, the, the European Accounting Associations annual congress and the Japan Accounting Associations annual conference and other international conference. 
He has published articles in reputable international journals such as the Journal of Contemporary Accounting and Economics, the Journal of Accounting Literature, the Asian Review of Accounting, the Asia Pacific Journal of Accounting and Economics. He serves as uh, an editorial board member uh, for the, in the Journal of Indonesian Economy and Business. So thanks for that. And also another journal, the Indonesian Journal of Accounting Research. In these sessions, uh, Professor Friendly uh, will share his expertise on the topic of greenwashing in the context of corporate reporting, regulatory and research perspective. This topic, uh, I believe, uh, very close to the first speaker. Uh, so please welcome Professor Pandy uh, to this stage, and the floor is yours. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Professor Nuru, for the introductions. Okay. So it's very nice to uh, have experience presenting my papers and meet my uh, former professors and colleagues here again. So now let's uh, continue with the topic of my uh, uh, speech uh, to tonight. Uh, I will cover the topic of greenwashings from the context of corporate reporting. As we might know, this issue or term of greenwashing is not the first time we hear it in the business literature because it first introduced in the marketing uh, field. But as the disclosure or reporting requirements for uh, accounting or financial reporting has expanded to go beyond financial numbers, now more and more uh, regulators, uh, users of these reports are getting concerned of what is this issue and what's this relevance. And by the end of this presentation, I would like to uh, invite the, or boost the interest of everyone here to pursue research related, related to this topic. So first, why this topic is important? Because the popularity of ESG related investment or financial instruments have grown significantly in the past few years. So in 2020, about $490 billion have been raised all across the globe for these kind of products that claim to sell green social and sustainability bonds. However, there are some concerns of reporting regarding these issues, these uh, issuance of financial instruments. First, as uh, Professor Das has explained in the beginning, uh, IFRS has just published uh, standards related to sustainable reporting just this year. So IFRS S1 and S2. Ha meanwhile, we already see this trend of uh, governments uh, and corporates issuing these uh, ESG-related financial instruments in the past four years. So there's a significant gap in between these two mm, timeline. And then, this is also co confounded with the lack of the unified global disclosure standards. And as we can see in the near future, as IFRS has published its standards, we will see that national governments will follow suit sooner or later. And due to this gap between the um, large uh, expansion of ESG related financial instruments and the uh, gap of the reporting standards, companies still have a, um, a room to disclose the informations in which they could not prove that their disclosure shows the real, um, what they claimed. So these concerns is what we will define as greenwashings. And for some of the statistics all over the world, uh, this growth in ESG-focused investment in Europe has raised significantly uh, by 55% in 2020. And if we look at the keywords or term of the name sustainability, um, there are more and more uh, financial instruments that put their 
uh, sustainability related names in their uh, product names, financial products names. And the same trend is observed in the US as well. And the performance of their sustainability related funds has been shown to outperform their non-sustainable funds, especially in the equity funds for both Europe and US. So, and this is the concern that many uh, investors have. So if they find that their current financial instruments is not performing well, they could just have some discretion to rebrand their financial products to look green. And this is a pretty significant risk, which is raised by uh, Forrester um, from Mayor Brown, one of the law firms. Here and um, therefore, uh, in the past few years, we have seen that there are increasing number of cases in which this investment, the false claim of the investment, has been brought up to light. So just this year in Australia, the regulators are starting to crack down on these financial instruments that mislead their claims. So this is an example of. Uh, for, uh, securities that claim they don't invest in these kind of, we can say, dirty companies or non-sustainable uh, companies, for example, in gambling, tobacco, etc. And we can see that this is just the starting point of the regulatory actions, which we might see to increase in the future. So this issue of greenwashing is also especially concerning in the um, area of finance, of financial industries. So in May 2023, this year, European Banking Authority have published this paper that presented their current findings on the issue of greenwashing. And this is especially important for financial uh, banks that claim to invest in sustainability related um, loans, for example, or they provide sustainability related, they want to invest in companies that, um, that promote this ESG or SDGs goals. So they started with again, defining what is greenwashings. And this is also the same definitions that we as uh, researchers also uh, agree on. So anytime companies provided claims or disclosure that overstated their environmental performance, then this practice could uh, distort the information that's given to the capital market and it will lead to uh, inefficient decision making. So let's uh, cover some of the uh, interesting findings from this report. So first, when this table is shown on how do the stakeholders feel on the sustainability claims? So surprisingly, most of the stakeholders, they are very concerned on the uh, susceptibility of all the claims on the left and how are they very sensitive to greenwashings. So almost more than the majority of these claims could be overstated by the preparers. And about the impact itself, we can see that the perception of the stakeholders also considered this to be very significant. However, when we compare these findings on how the stakeholders perceive greenwashing and its importance, do they actually have identified any occurrence of uh, actual or potential greenwashing? And the answer is still no, because we still don't have any clear framework on what is greenwashing and how to define it. And if we look at the total alleged incidence of uh, overstatement, or in this case, greenwashing, by geographical locations, we can find pretty interesting two groups here. So on the top part, we can see that mm, most of the misleading communications are of companies located in North America and EU markets is significantly higher compared to other uh, regions outside of North America and EU. Again, this does not mean that uh, other part 
from of the world that's not in North America or EU has less case of greenwashing, it could just mean that they have weaker enforcement action, just like Professor Dusk has mentioned. And as uh, times goes by, as these uh, proliferation of ESG related financial instruments become higher and the related reporting that comes up with it increase, this, we can expect the total alleged incidence of this will increase as well. And as we know, ESG related topics has three components, environmental, social, and governance. We can see that most of the misleading statement is not monopolized by one component. So environmental, social, government, each of them are pretty susceptible to um, uh, greenwashing, especially the environmental and social ones. Okay. So if we do a further breakdown on what type of environmental claims they are more sensitive to greenwashings, you can see that the issue of climate change, so the ratios of the alleged incident of greenwashing is increased on that part. So that's uh, one trend that we should be uh, particularly pay our attention to. So companies that claim they do well on reducing emissions while in actuality, when the performance is measured, it might not match with their, what they claim. Then if we focus on the um, alleged greenwashing incidents in EU, especially for the financial and banking sectors, we can see that in overall um, total of the incidents here, the majority of the cases uh, still could be alleged to the companies that belong in non-financial sectors, which makes sense because we can see that companies that operate in manufacturing or extractive industry, they are more prone to this claim. Although this is not good news for the financial sectors either, even in EU, as we can see the, the trend for both uh, non-financial sectors and financial sectors is increasing as well. Okay, and then if we compare the perception of impact of greenwashing, comparing them with the authorities, in this case regulators, compared with shareholders, we can see some gap here. So the authorities, they're concerned that the greenwashing will have negative impact on their reputational risk and operational risk. These are just two of the biggest one. However, if we compare it with how does the uh, stakeholders perceive this impact, they are more uniform compared to what the authorities uh, consider the negative impact of greenwashing will be. So we can conclude that the EU, which has adopted uh, very comprehensive regulations for sustainable finance disclosure as FDR since March 2021, we can, uh, I can share that this is currently being uh, considered as the golden standard of the regulations for sustainable finance disclosures. And in essence, these regulations requires asset managers to not just consider the financial impacts of their financial instruments, but also what's the environmental and social risk and address the potential adverse of the investment to environmental and social. And what are the outcomes of this regulation after it's been enacted? Of course, the confidence on market increase. The, there's an observed increase in flow of cash into ESG funds uh, pretty significantly. And the crackdown by regulations to ensure the ESG funds really claim what they are doing. Some funds that uh, commit this claim, uh, misleading claims, has been delisted as well from the market. So there are some good news in this regard. And on the side, other side of the pond in US, what are the SEC are doing? They are also keep track on the uh, mitigating the issue of greenwashings. At the moment, on May last year, they have issued two proposals on greenwashings. So they follow pretty much similar uh, strategy with the EU one. So they want to require the 
investment advisor, fund manager to disclose more information on their strategies, and then make sure that what they claim in the name of their financial instruments is consistent with what they claim to do. So they want to make sure that at least 80% of the assets really do what they claim to be uh, doing from the label of their financial instruments. And how are the current uh, asset managers and institutional investors responding on this SEC regulations proposal? So BlackRock, which I believe this name is pretty familiar uh, with most of us, mm, one of the largest money manager, asset manager in tr with trillion of assets, say that regulations we introduce more complexity, costs, and there's an issue on the lack of definition of materiality. However, there are also some stakeholders, they are pretty supportive on this new SEC regulation proposal because smaller fund managers, or in this case, pick one example of the uh, pension, asset pension manager, those uh, uh, institutions or entities that do not have resources to carefully uh, check the disclosures of each individual investment funds to see whether their claim of ESG performance match with their disclosures. This proposed regulation will simplify their portfolio selection process. And then uh, IICSB, uh, which in this case, uh, IFRS has again, um, as join forces to develop uh, assurance standards that should accompany the assurance side of these sustainability reporting standards. So now the assurance services have to um, increase their standards to match up with the assurance standards of financial statements. And that's the goal of ISCSB to set up this proposal and the consultation will close into 2023 this year and it will be interesting to see and keep track on the comments from the stakeholders. And European Union um, again has uh, taken a lead in this uh, in enforcing the external assurance for all of the um, financial instruments that claim to be sustainable there. by ISB cover both the reasonable and limited assurance. And at the moment, um, most of the assurance provided by, let's say, big four companies, they are only limited to review level of assurance, or in this case, limited assurance. So hopefully, with the development of the standards, the um, standards and robustness of the assurance will increase and increase the confidence for investors to use the informations on the environmental and social and governance informations. And want to share how was the uh, perspective of this issue of greenwashing in Japan. So in Japan, the companies, they have been considered to be one of the pioneers in terms of disclosing their ESG informations. But then the issues also comes to the assurance. Uh, they do most of the Japanese company assure uh, did the review for their ESG disclosure? So the answer is no. So most Japanese company they are still lagging in terms of these assurance for ESG information relative to other developed economies. And as usual in Japan, most of the change in regulations they prefer to use the wait and see approach to see how the EU is going, what's the responses from the SEC. And as such, there's a, um, we'll just want to wait and see what the government is doing and follow what's best for the um, local market. As such, there's also a need to reform so some existing corporate governance structure because the existing structure of corporate governance is tailored towards um, mitigating some uh, behavior that's dysfunctional towards 
the, the um, misconduct of financial information, but not for ESGs. So probably they'll need some reform for corporate governance in this point. And this is also one issue that we have to consider in terms of greenwashing allegations, because again, there's still no clear way how to define who committed greenwashings. So there's a very high risk of committing type one error. So uh, false positive risk that we should be aware of. There's one quote from one of the biggest asset management company in Japan, Nomura. And I think this represents the one perspective from the issuers, right? So we can say in general, most companies, they don't have ill intent. So we should be careful on uh, not too hasty in uh, committing or labeling one or two companies to commit greenwashing as this does not, again, according to this quote, does not um, promote positive behaviors. All right, so how should technology help in detecting greenwashing? So on this one interesting paper, it's published in 2020, on these two institutions, one of the research center and the uh, research center from Imperial College of London, we have tried to use NLP technology, which is the core of AI generative um, tools like ChatGPT, and use it to analyze company disclosure. So that's what they claim. They could use the technology to detect potential greenwashings. So yeah, that could be one possible directions. We let AI do their thing. And based on their claim, again, this is not a peer review paper, so should take this claim with a grain of salt. And they said they could distinguish between brown and green firms. In this case, brown are the companies that are alleged with greenwashings. All right, so I think I would like to conclude my uh, talk here today by again showing some uh, snapshot of research that have been done to investigate this issue on greenwashing, especially from the perspective of corporate reporting. So there are many aspects we could uh, start to explore. So start from the basics. How do we define environmental disclosure? How do we measure environmental performance? There still could be a lot of debate in these issues. And then investigate the effect of introduction of new regulations in one major part of the market like EU and how will it impact the regional, um, the state of the uh, regulations in the region and in the global world. And then using uh, samples from each uh, individual local jurisdictions and see how does this greenwashing issue impact other facts or uh, aspects of the business, like tax reform. Mm. And also some more uh, conceptual issues like shared value, uh, value relevance, and that topics could be integrated with this greenwashing as well. Okay, and then of course, to connect this with the uh, Professor Das talk in terms of litigations, we might see an increase in uh, more court cases that provide and debates or clash of arguments on how do you define environmental disclosures? How do you measure it? Mm. Okay, I think that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Friendly, for your interesting presentations. We just had uh, the privilege of hearing from Professor Friendly and gaining valuable insight by shedding light on the issue of greenwashing, specifically within the domain of corporate uh, reporting and uh, their impacts on several risks, uh, such as operational risks, strategic risks, and et cetera. And uh, Professor Friendly also emphasized the greenwashing uh, in environmental, social, and government investment report is a significant concern within the finance and sustainability sector. In addition, uh, the presentation also emphasized the role of uh, NLP technology to, an, uh, to analyze uh, the company disclosure and also provide additional research on the relevant, uh, related topics. So thanks a lot. Uh, again, Professor Friendly.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we still have uh, last but not least <laughs> presenter for this uh, uh, event. Uh, hopefully, you are still awake because after having uh, dinner, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let us continue our learning journey by inviting our third speaker, Professor Yanto Chandra, to present uh, his thoughts uh, with the title Blockchain as a New Enabler in Social Entrepreneurship Beyond the Hype and the Sweet Tolls in Sustainability. But first of all, let me introduce the curriculum vitae of Professor Chandra. Um, Professor Yanto Chandra is an associate professor at the City University of Hong Kong from the Department of Public and International Affairs. Uh, at the same time, he is also co-direct uh, the Technology Policy Law Lab from the same university. He completed his PhD in Entrepreneurship and Master of Commerce and Marketing at the University of New South Wales, uh, uh, Australia. He was trained as an accountant in his first degree and uh, the research focus of Professor Chandra on entrepreneurship and strategy in the technology and social context and their implications on policy, economy, and society. He has a lot of publications in leading business journals, uh, including the Financial, financial Times, uh, 50 journals uh, such as Journal of Business Ethics, Journal of Business Venturing, Journal of International Business Studies, Journal of Business Venture Insight, and, and also other policy journals such as Policy and Internet, Public Administration Review, Public Management Review, and Work Management. He is also, this is also interesting part, he is also one of the first who published comics yeah? <laughs> that bring across the principles of entrepreneurship and sustainability. One of the comics, because last night, uh, Professor Chandra sent me the link uh, of one of the comics, uh, two comics, I just googling yesterday night. And the comic, uh, The O's Lab, uh, A Story of Social Entrepreneurship, it is available on Amazon.com. <laughs> I hope I could uh, get this con. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, Professor Chandra also won international prestigious awards such as the best paper uh, at the previous Academy of Management uh, uh, Conference, uh, Entrepreneurship Divisions 2022, Koeman Best Paper Award 2021, International Social Innovation Research Conference Award, and uh, 12 years ago, uh, he won uh, Emerald Literary uh, Literacy 2010 Award. He was ranked in the top two persons of all scholars in the business and economics category by Stanford University in 2021. So he's very famous. So we are very happy to have you in here. And in addition to that, he, he was also ranked as one of the top five scholars in political science and public administrations in China in 2020. Additionally, he is also an associate editor for many journals. A uh, few of them are a Journal of Business Venturing Insight, Business Ethics, Environment and Responsibility, Responsibility, Social Enterprise Journal, and Journal of Social Entrepreneurship, and other uh, several leading journals. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Chandra to give speech. So, the floor is yours, Prof. Thank you so much for the generous introduction, Ibu Nuru. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm uh, I'm glad uh, that I'm here and with you all. Um, as as we have heard from in the past two days, uh, preliminary talks, ESG has been the common theme. And just now, I learned a lot about greenwashing. And despite that, um, you know, a lot of ESG reporting and different types of accounting standards for you know, environmental and social reporting has been in place for some years, uh, we're still seeing a lot of greenwashing taking place. So if you look at what happened uh, with, for example, with the ESG, I found that the ESG movement is very interesting concept. And I can see that's a lot of people with good intention to save the planet and do something good for the society. But at the same time, there are a lot of challenges that comes with ESG. One of which is it's expensive and it's often treated as a cost center by most firms. 
So that is on, on one side on the firms. On the consumer side, it's often quite uh, a, dis a disincentive for consumers to pay more if the products or the services have ESG content, right? So, and again, if you look at adjacent research, for example, in a corporate social responsibility, um, the past 40 years of research on ECSR and firm performance have shown very mixed findings. There's almost no serious or straightforward relationship between doing more CSR with getting higher firm performance. But one, one hindsight with that is that we still live in the world of shareholder capitalism in which ESG and uh, whatever you call it, ESG, CSR or sustainability initiatives still remain the side dish or the garnish rather than the, the main course of what firms and organizations are offering. And what that main dish is really is still the pursuit of profit, right? So, so, so this gets us to think that a lot of these ESG and sustainability initiative that we have heard all along is a little bit more of a hype or a kind of a sweet talk, if I, if I could it in that way. So that's why I have this a little bit provocative title, subtitle, Beyond the Hype and Sweet Talks in Sustainability. And why am I using this? Because I'm trying to draw some parallels between what happened with the field of uh, sustainability broadly with what happened with an area of research that I've been working on for the past couple of years, which is social entrepreneurship. So I started as an entrepreneurship scholar, but I stumbled upon some very interesting experience of what social entrepreneurs do, and I, I began to explore deeper until, until this moment. So it's been, it's been a, a number of years. So just, just so that we're all on the same page, um, so social entrepreneurship has, has, has come in different forms and shapes, but um, one of the ways to describe it is that social entrepreneurship is a way of combining uh, what the market is good at and what a civil society is good at and what the government or the state is very good at. So in other words, social entrepreneurship combines market value, social value, and public value into one single organization. Now, don't you think it's so beautiful as a concept? And that beauty of that concept is also the problem with the social entrepreneurship and the movement around social entrepreneurship, which I'm going to allude a little bit in a, in a few moments. Um, so I'm just drawing an example, just to put everyone on the same page. One example of social enterprise, a common type of it is called work integration social enterprise. So this is a type of enterprise in which they try to create social value or create value which is based on some social moral goals. For example, they try to employ some disadvantaged groups of people, disabled, refugees, etc., provide them with training, give them income, and give them dignity and equal relationships. At the same time, they're using, creating, using a business mechanism to, create, to capture value by creating a business, right? So for example, in this case of IE Bakery, which is uh, quite a renowned social enterprise from Hong Kong, they're selling bakery products that are made by these disabled people. And the profits generated from this social enterprise will be used to support the beneficiaries and to scale up uh, the social venture. But again, this uh, social venture, like this I Bakery, has been around for many years. But you can see that it's not so easy to run this thing. And many of them has gone into bankruptcy. And, uh, and we, we haven't got a lot of studies about the mortality rate of this type of ventures, but I do believe there's a lot of them. And in terms of definitions of this, what we call about social entrepreneurship, it really depends on which uh, disciplines you're coming from. We have people from design who are very interested about this, how to design a wheelchair, how to design a house that fits in with a certain particular groups. We also have people from law. We have people from social work who are trying to study how social work practices can help uh, a certain disadvantaged groups, right? Uh, we have the views from nonprofits, which is how nonprofits have embraced market principles or the marketization of, of, of the nonprofit organization. But the common one or, or the most commonly adopted view is perhaps the first and the second one, which look at social entrepreneurship as a form of hybrid organizing and hybrid organizations in which one organization is trying to combine multiple logics of values together, such as having commercial 
and social logics, and sometimes they add further, like religious or cultural logics in one single organization. And why do they do that? Because they want to achieve a higher profit. And when they mean this higher profit is always something related to something that benefits not only a small number of shareholders, but they're talking about the broader stakeholders and the society. So uh, the field of social enterprise has been around for almost 30 years, and a lot has been studied. The early stages of research in this area has looked at a lot of psychological variables, like why do people want to be a social entrepreneur? Right? And to look at their personality, their compassion, and people are trying to develop a typology of different types, and uh, the behavior, the intent, et cetera, et cetera. My research has been looking at the performance of social enterprises. I'm also looking at uh, the public governance of social enterprise, and also the social enterprise as an emancipatory tool. And one of these uh, studies that I have done was related to how terrorists um, who eventually set up, who, who, who found a new way of life, and then he set up a social venture in a form of a restaurant, and then he reached out to other terrorists and prisoners who are still in the prison and helped them to find a new way of life and work in a social enterprise, and who later become an agent of change to further influence other people in a positive way, and things like that, and so it just keep on uh, uh, moving. So why did I talk about this hype and sweet talk about social enterprise? Because there are some critiques about this social enterprise, which is not so widely discussed and sort of debated. And for example, one of the, early, one of the earliest papers here was published in a top management journal, Academy of Management Journal, that look at the hype behind social stock market or impact investing. So think about it, if you have social enterprise that are looking for funding, uh, the idea is this social enterprise can, at one particular point in time, get listed in a stock market. And this is what it called social stock market. But there's a lot of hype behind this in which after many years of trying and experimenting, it still didn't work. And this reminds us of the broader literature in technology, for example, 3D technology that was also considered the next and up and coming technology, but until now, there's been a lot of reports that say this technology is still hype. In the field of sustainability, there are always also there are a lot of publications and scholars who are being critical of what's going on with the entire practice and research on, so, on sustainability. They find this B word that I circled there, uh, which, which, which tell us that a lot of these things that we heard about sustainability is a lot of exaggeration, uh, inflated expectations, um, a lot of big promises and policy uh, promises, but there's a lack of sincere ambition and serious action to back it up and to really do these things. So eventually you can see social entrepreneurship if, if you think that all along this ESG movement has been more like a rhetoric, more like um, um, sort of a way of, of a hype and, 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 and uh, um, you know, so, something that sounds beautiful, what, what sort of organizations and templates can, that can we use to really implement the, the ESG in a way that it becomes the identity and the strategy of organizations? So my argument is that social entrepreneurship is one of the ways to translate and transform the ESG values and movements inside the organizations. For example, again, when we talk about this hype thing, there's a, a book, one of the earliest book in the field of social entrepreneurship is How to Change the World, Social Entrepreneurs and the Power of New Ideas. So this was written uh, by David Bornstein, but to be honest, the social entrepreneurship field has not done that much. It, it, the idea is very beautiful. It's really interesting that you can do a business helping some people and create a huge change, and it didn't deliver that much. And again, Muhammad Yunus talked about building a social business, but to be honest, the whole movements, including Ashoka, Schwab, is still not there yet. Uh, some scholars have talked about, has been very critical about the development of the social entrepreneurship. For example, they say that social entrepreneurship is facing a solutionism problem. What this means is that they're trying to say that a lot of people trying to assume because of the beautiful concept behind social entrepreneurship, that it becomes a panacea. It becomes like one pill that can cure all ills of the society. But eventually, it's, it, social entrepreneurship is not that successful. I'm, I'm taking a quite critical perspective of this, 
uh, because I'm, I'm quite familiar with what's going on in, in the literature and with the practice. But apparently there are a lot of these social and environmental issues that we are facing require policy solutions. So one example is the case of homelessness. So the author was comparing the homelessness issue in the United Kingdom versus in Finland, in which, for example, in, in the Britain, uh, they uh, embrace this new liberal uh, values and concepts in which almost the government almost put very little money to solve homelessness problems and they let the market to solve this problem. Well, in fact, in Finland, being again a social democratic country, they rely strongly on policy solution and it worked much better in tackling homelessness issue. And there's a range of other social, uh, social problems that s policy actions really work really well. And running a social enterprise is a tough business. I won't go through this, but any basic students who have taken uh, accounting 101 will know that uh, in a profit and loss statement. So what happened in a social enterprise is it is an inefficient way to run a business because your cost is higher. And at the end of the year with your profit, you should think about how you're gonna redistribute this profit to the people that you care about. So it's, it's a really tough business really. Another issue is the f issue of identity. I don't know if you have read, uh, there's a, an article in uh, National Geographic in which back, back in the 1800s, uh, there's uh, a court action uh, against a, a trader, an importer. So this guy was trying to import tomato into the United States. So at that time, it depends whether if you import fruits, uh, you know, you don't need to pay tax. If you import vegetables, you pay tax. The question is, for example, tomato, is it a fruit or is it a vegetable? So, so this was finally had to be resolved in a court to know who is the winner. And actually social entrepreneurship is facing a similar issue in terms of its identity crisis. So in social entrepreneurship, partly some people thought that it's a non-profit organization, it's NGO. Some people thought it's just a normal business, but what is it really? And some of them have been backed and owned by governments. For example, in South Korea, the government is a major investor of a lot of social enterprises to create jobs for the disadvantaged communities. So what is social enterprise? What is its identity? So that is still an unresolved debate. And social entrepreneurship, who does it serve? Is it a servant of two masters or should it serve only one master? Again, it's about profit or purpose. And, and if, if the organization doesn't manage and govern itself really well, it could mission drift and turn into one or the other. For example, two of the biggest cases of microfinance institutions has drifted. They started as with a very strong social purpose with some commercial purpose, but once they got listed in stock market, the shareholders becomes you know, millionaire by overnight and it really changed everything inside organizations. So who does it need to serve? So that's the question. Another issue is the lack of official and legitimate status in social entrepreneurship. There, there is still very little um, sort of definitions or the kind of innovation to create legal forms for social entrepreneurship. Uh, even in Hong Kong, we don't have one. In, in the world, perhaps the UK has one, the Community Interest Company, CIC, but in most parts of the world, we don't have it. So this creates a lot of problems for social entrepreneurs who are trying to sell the product or services to the government to participate in public bidding. And also if they want to access some government fundings because their identity is not clear and their legal structure is not very clear. And from consumer side, they often are not very clear which shop is a social enterprise, which one is not, because many of them don't provide the labels. Uh, back again to the issue of hype in a social entrepreneurship, we, we thought that social entrepreneurship can solve a lot of problems, but in one of our studies of uh, social enterprises that emerged in the post-disaster environment in the Philippines, because Philippines has been disrupted a lot by natural disasters, a lot of these social enterprises come with these uh, neoliberal, it's a modern business concept, isn't it? So they focus on meritocracy, you know, you work and you get the pay or you get the loan from social enterprise, you have to repay. And all of these ways of doing things in social enterprise is uh, at odds with what's going on with the local communities in the Philippines, in, in the barangays, or here we call it the kampung, the spirit of kampung. So there's a lot of resistance, a lot of misuse and abuse of the, the, the things that the social enterprise provide to the local communities. And we also see that in terms of how the social enterprise practice has been around uh, for, for, for the past 30 years, 
um, the movement seems to cool down a little bit, in my view. And we see that there's not so many new ideas, but people are just recycling ideas, look at the big events, uh, social world, social enterprise world forum and others. And there's a lack of new breakthroughs in terms of what social enterprise can do. And also to change people's mindset is really not easy. And also the growth problems. As I mentioned earlier, it's a tough business to run a social enterprise. So we, we really see social enterprise has grown so large to become unicorns, to get public listed. It's, it's very rare to see this phenomenon. And I also talk about the failures of uh, social stock exchanges in some of the biggest places for, 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 for the financial hub. And also the rise of pseudo social entrepreneurship in which the social enterprise try to solve problems, but in fact, they're instilling new problems. Um, there's still a hope for social entrepreneurship, really. One of which is policymakers love it because a lot of social enterprise calculate social return on investment. So if you put $1 of money, you will know how much money you're going to get back. And social entrepreneurship is a very useful tool for policymaking. And, and, and rather than the government take the risk to, to innovate, they could let the social enterprise innovate and work together with them. And we also see the rise of silent social ventures in which more and more uh, companies are embracing the ideals and values of social enterprise without saying out loudly that we are social enterprise. And this is one example from Singapore in which the founder was a former criminal and drug addict and it becomes a very successful uh, chain restaurants that employ a lot of criminals with a lot of tattoos in their body. So um, there's a lot of problems in the social enterprise scholarship. I won't go through them, but one thing I want to highlight is there's still a lack of causality studies, different types of experiments, some of which we are working on in our lab, and also the use of new technologies such as blockchain. So this leads me to the final part about the blockchain part. Why I bring this? Because I thought this is quite an interesting technology which is still underutilized. For example, we have been through the early 1990s with Web 1.0 with Yahoo and Hotmail, and then the kind of social media that we are using which is a web 2.0, we can read and write, and we are entering upon the web 3, read, write, and own, or what we call the decentralized web. So most of you already know what is a blockchain. You can think of it as an online Excel seed in which all of us can make transactions or enter data without anyone can delete anything except that we can only append or add more information because it's covered and protected by some cryptographic codes and there's a consensus mechanism in which members will validate every transactions and every data inside it. So what it does is really this blockchain, it reduces the need for a lot of intermediaries, such as lawyers, insurance companies, banks, et cetera, et cetera. So um, blockchain is actually a form of a way to organize. But little that people talk about is the role of smart contracts. So smart contract is actually the brain in the blockchain. So for example, if someone runs a social enterprise and they have some vendors or some employees, the, the smart contract will capture the terms and conditions of this relationship and they can execute payment if the employee has have done the work, if the vendors have uh, met their requirements, instead of one party will take advantage of one another. Um, so there's this new theory about external enablement, which I'm going to go through quickly. So what it does is that um, some of these new concepts or ideas in entrepreneurship that's trying to say that the external environment creates some disruption, and this disruption could be used by actors such as entrepreneurs to trigger some change to create organizations and things like that. And what these entrepreneurs can do is actually to go through what we call entrepreneurial action. And there's been a lot of debate about entrepreneurship, about the nature of opportunity. Just like cost is so important for economies, opportunity is the core foundational construct in entrepreneurship. And there's been like 20 years of debate about you know, whether opportunity is discovered or created or what. So this bunch of scholars is trying to say that opportunity is just a bunch of possibilities that can be actualized. <coughs> so they're talking about if we have a certain knowledge <coughs> and a certain motivation, certain people could identify a certain opportunity that exists or, or third person opportunity. And if you have something else, you could transform that into an opportunity for yourself. So we have done some early studies about how blockchain can help ordinary artists because a lot of ordinary artists have been discriminated in the work. So for example, this is one of our works on 
uh, artists who have done digital digital art in the form of non fungible tokens. And apparently, a lot of them, of these artists that have been uh, oppressed or discriminated in 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 the countries where they live, they've been able to find liberation and find a new market for the kind of art work that they could do. So that is one of the social value brought about by the blockchain. There's also a lot of potential applications for blockchain, such as for crowdfunding, social crowdfunding, for example, these are the initiatives by, by the UN bodies uh, working together with artists, and they, um, they, they uh, sell them through some online platform to raise funds and to help some refugees and some uh, children's uh, internet access and things like that. So there's a lot of usage, for example, it's been used for peer-to-peer -peer, uh, knowledge, uh, electricity sharing. Uh, this is uh, the solar panel roof in Switzerland in some villages in which uh, people who own the house, they had a solar panel that can sell electricity to each other and also to some electricity company. And this is con uh, controlled by the, the contract. I'll, I'll go to the last part, which is the one example of how blockchain is used by organic rice farmers in Cambodia. So you can see the blockchain can help the poor farmers to ensure that they have the latest information about the market and they are being protected in a smart contract in their dealings with very powerful actors like agents, intermediaries, and others. So it protect them, stabilize the price, and for consumers like us, we know where does this rice come from because there's information about the origin of, of this rice. So again, I'm trying to say that there's a lot of things that we can do with blockchain. Uh, if for people who want to do studies on social entrepreneurship and sustainability. We can do it to study performance, uh, how blockchain can allow us to understand how people conceive new opportunities, how blockchain can help fairness of different types of stakeholders. We can use it as a tool to measure impact as a, as a way to design and impl implement new policies and to do uh, impactful research. So just quickly, uh, the governance by code, which is the smart contract, which is the core of the blockchain, you can have the actors and stakeholders working together, and there's this external enable mechanisms enabled by the blockchain. It enables you to do automation, compression of time and activities, and expansion of markets, and verification of a lot of information. And that will trigger a lot of entrepreneurial action for people to see ideas and opportunities and actualizing them. And this would eventually trigger some outcomes at the individual level, increasing people's income, well-being, et cetera, also at the organizational level, uh, impact and revenue, and also at the institutional level, such as social progress. So I stop it there <coughs> by saying that um, we can learn, perhaps, what the future of sustainable, sustainability would be like by understanding what happened to the field of social entrepreneurship. And there's still a lot of things that can be done, and we hope that uh, blockchain, perhaps, could be one of the new things that people can consider in using not only as an area for research, but also in collaboration with the practitioners to help organizations create value for, for the society. I'll, I'll stop it there and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chandra, for a thought-provoking presentation. It is quite interesting. You provide a clear discussion on the role of social entrepreneurship and how blockchain technology is used by uh, particularly leveraging the aspect of blockchain technology uh, social entrepreneurs can unlock new avenues for positive change efficiency and inclusivity in addressing various social and environmental challenges so thank you very much um, thanks uh, to all uh, for your engaging contributions uh, to these discussions we have covered a lot of uh, ground and gain valuable insights from our esteemed panelists. Now it is time uh, to open the floor to you, our audience, for any questions, comments, or thoughts you may have. Uh, please feel free to raise your hand um, if you have questions. I will do my best to ensure uh, we get to as many questions as possible. Uh, when I recognize you, could you please uh, state your name and affiliations? Uh, we also have the participants from Zoom. Uh, you may also uh, write the questions. There are about 20, uh, 22 participants joining in the discussions uh, via a Zoom platform. Uh, to ensure that we have diverse uh, of frames of perspective, I encourage you to keep your questions uh, concise 
and directly related to the topic we discussed today. So let's kick off to the Q&A key key sessions. Uh, our time is quite limited, only 15 minutes, so I only open for the first round of Q&A sessions. Who would like to start first? Yeah. Uh, the gentleman over there, uh, the lady in the middle, the last person probably. Okay. Please. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Muhammad Ahmi Hussein. You can call me Hussein. I'm from Open Petran, Jawa Timur, Surabaya. Uh, my question is to Professor Chandra. It's very interesting to see how blockchain can take part in Cambodia. My question is, um, I try to be straightforward. Um, when this blockchain was introduced in Cambodia, is there any intervention by the existing distribution channel or do they take part in the introduction of this blockchain? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hussein from Surabaya. Uh, we move forward to uh, the lady over there. So, my name is Pradevira from Universitas Gajah Mada. I have a question for Professor Dr. Yanto Chandra. Um, there's a bunch of people who really understand about technology. Um, they are very in the weeds and they are up to speed in terms of the what the latest projects are. But then, to the total side, the others misunderstand, including me. Um, I am still growing in uh, financial literacy and technology understanding for the matter. And then we know that uh, using technologies, uh, we can solve some of the world's toughest problem. And perhaps uh, social entrepreneurship is one of them. So the question is how to start empowering uh, the women's social enterprise uh, to to gain the access to the digital finance and economy in the very beginning or in the very fundamental way, especially for the people who still get misunderstood about that, while they are in the progress um, gaining the financial literacy uh, for the matter. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mbak Vera. Can you just uh, I think I think both questions uh, share some similar okay, themes similar. about how they how we can overcome the barrier for for, for them to embrace uh, a new technology such as blockchain, despite that perhaps a lot of these farmers are you know most likely you know less educated and and they could be have technological phobia to adopt some new technologies. For example, the case of these uh, organic rice in Cambodia, uh, the the farmers the project was initiated by uh, a local NGO in partnership with uh, some uh, larger organizations. If I'm not mistaken, it was by Oxfam. So Oxfam with another local NGO and they work together to, to introduce this technology. And the technology of this blockchain is available on the smartphone. So the farmers uh, would have access uh, to, to the smartphone, will, will be able to, to, to add, uh, access uh, this technology, uh, which, which is actually a, a, market, a market platform for buyers and sellers. So for, for, for these, Farmers, they can see that this is a way that they could engage the market in a different way, rather than somehow being exploited by some intermediaries who, who, who you know, would see some loopholes. And and, and same questions. Uh, I forgot your name. Um, I, I think education is really important, particularly when we talk about this segment of the people. Um, even among among the general population, the more educated one, the blockchain technology is still a mystery. And how does it work? And you know, do we need a crypto coin? You need a digital currencies, and you know, you need a wallet, digital wallet, which is different from your bank account. How do you set this up? This is actually a technical hurdle. So a lot of the education needs to be in place, and and I think this is where um, actually all parties can 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 work together. Not only the government, but also like the nonprofit sector, the social enterprise sector can play, and university can can play a role as well, and pr to provide not only some theoretical but also some practical experience of how to actually use this to, to help the people that you want to help. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Chandra. I still, we still have uh, about five minutes uh, left. Uh, we 
then open for another uh, questions from the participants. Okay, still in the middle. Yes, please. Good afternoon. Uh, I have a good good evening. Sorry, uh, I have a question for uh, Dr. Friendy and Professor Das. As we know, the news today, uh, the carbon trade market is officially open in Indonesian stock market. Uh, for the Dr. Freddy, uh, what is your uh, opinion uh, regarding uh, this news? Could it uh, sur surpress the greenwashing or even it will ignite uh, another phenomenon of uh, greenwashing in Indonesia? And for the professor Das, uh, what could you see on the uh, reporting reinforcement uh, point of view yeah, regarding these uh, new opportunities of the carbon trading uh, in Indonesia? Thank you. Uh, could you please uh, mention your name I'm, and I'm your affiliation? My name is uh, Izzat Abidi. I'm a master student in Universitas Gajah Mada. Okay, thank you, thank you Mas Izzat. Uh, maybe I would like to give uh, the first response to to you, uh, Professor Friendly. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, I believe in the most important part of the greenwashing is the is there any regulatory framework that exists to ensure the any institutions that want to participate in the carbon market how do they back up the claim of their let's say the carbon they are traded and in terms of the way the Indonesian government could proceed, I believe there might be some pretty fast development on these issues. Um, and it will be interesting to see as if the regulatory institution will follow 100% the regulation um, published by IFRS. As we know, the current financial reporting standards, Indonesians, uh, follow the IFRS standards. Whether this will continue for the ESG reporting regimes, I think there's a choice that, that could be made. And to uh, directly answer your questions, this will introduce, again, I believe a more opportunity for, again, uh, claim for greenwashings that could happen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And also another question uh, to Professor Dex. Can you see uh, the questions, Professor Das? Do you want to respond? Would you li like? To? Yeah, I'm. I haven't seen the news uh, today about the opening of this um, a carbon trading scheme, so I can't really judge the setup of this of this local market. Of course, it's important that um, yeah, this trading is yeah efficient, that it is transparent, that um, yeah, stakeholders can really develop trust in those um, in those carbon trading uh, markets. So also those those trading schemes have to be transparent, and there has to be some oversight um, that you know the the trading is is functioning as intended. Um, so that that's all I can add to the discussion. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Dax, for the response. And this is uh, the end of our Q&A sessions. Uh, thank you all for your valuable insight and engaging discussions today. It's been a truly enlightening and thought-provoking uh, panel sessions. Uh, we have covered a wide range of topic and perspective. And I'm sure uh, our audience has gained uh, a lot of uh, information from these uh, discussions. I want to express to um, uh, I want to express my gratitude to our esteemed panelists uh, for generously sharing their ex expertise and perspective. Uh, your contributions have enriched uh, the discussions and broadened our understanding of particularly the three related topic that we discuss uh, today. Uh, to our beloved audience, thank you for joining us and being an active part of these conversations your suggestions and engage, uh, your questions and engagements have made these sessions all the more meaningful 
before we officially conclude, uh, I would like to extend uh, an invitation to everyone here to continue these conversations uh, outside of this panel forum. Networking and collaborations are fundamental to growth and progress. So on behalf uh, of the organizing committee, and um, I would like to thank to our sponsor as well and partners for their support in making this event possible. So let's us keep the momentum going, uh, building on what we have discussed here today, uh, safe travels for those who will be traveling tomorrow uh, to the home country and see you uh, at the next uh, occasions and hopefully next year. Thank you once again. And please give very a big applause to the panelists and the participants here and joining the Zoom. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.